now it is time for the last word with the great Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. Uh, I heard your discussion earlier about uh, all of the racism, personal racism, uh, directed at Kamala Harris as a candidate. And it's fascinating to listen to all these pundit discussions uh, that appear that, that over, the course, over the course of the last couple of days about, oh, they should have done this and they should have done that, and they've got to learn to appeal to these voters. I haven't heard anyone say how you're supposed to appeal to the racist who will never vote for a woman. How is that supposed to happen? I'm waiting for that instruction. Well, when you find it, let me know. Yeah. Well, we're going we're to consider it later uh, in this hour, too. I, I think it's, it's the issue that needs much more attention than it's getting. Have a great show, Lawrence. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Well, exactly 52 years ago today, Republican President Richard Nixon won his reelection in a landslide, a real landslide, over Democratic Senator George McGovern, who was running on what turned out to be the losing campaign Democratic platform of ending the Vietnam War. Richard Nixon won 49, yes, 49 states with only Massachusetts voting no on Nixon and no on the Vietnam War. Richard Nixon, who lost his 1960 presidential campaign by less than 1% to John F. Kennedy and won his first term in 1968 by less than 1% was re-elected 52 years ago with 61% of the vote, a margin that would be impossible to achieve in today's electorate. The Vietnam War ended up lasting longer than Richard Nixon's second term. 18 months after Richard Nixon's second inauguration, he resigned from the presidency while impeachment proceedings were underway against him and the House of Representatives. Now, we know opponents of Donald Trump's second term will not be as lucky as the opponents of Richard Nixon's second term. We already know there is no possibility of impeaching and removing Donald Trump from office no matter what he does. The United States Supreme Court has said it's okay for Donald Trump to commit any crimes he might want to commit as president of the United States, and Republican senators have made it clear there is absolutely nothing Donald Trump could ever do that would compel them to vote guilty in a Senate impeachment trial. But what if Donald Trump, in effect, resigns the presidency but keeps the title? What if Donald Trump just hands over the job to someone else or to a few people and does nothing? Maybe plays golf when he has the strength, which might not be so often as he turns 80 in his second year in office. And so the question we consider tonight is, President who? Who's going to really be the president? And what is that president going to actually do? Donald Trump did his first interview today since the election, and he actually revealed nothing. He revealed intentions to do nothing. NBC's Kristen Welker got Donald Trump on the phone and asked a very simple question. What's your first action? Do you take on, do you do tariffs first? Do you do your deportation plan? What's first? Question could not be simpler, what's first? And at no point in the words that Donald Trump offered was there even a hint of an answer. He never even said the word tariffs or the word deportation. In his answer to that very simple question of what's first, he said, well, I think we have a lot of firsts because we can do things at, a, we can do things at one time. You know, we obviously have to make the border strong and powerful. And we have to, at the same time, we want all our people to come in the country. And you know, I'm not somebody that says, no, you can't come in. We want people to come in. We're gonna have a lot of businesses coming into our country. They want to come into our country. We're the pot of gold. We're still the pot of gold. And Donald Trump rambled on, talking about 
not wanting people to come in the country who are murderers and drug lords. And that was it. Of course, no one wants murderers or drug lords to come into the country. And so the actual answer to what's your first action was, I think we have a lot of firsts. That was it. That was the whole thing. That is not a president who is eager to get to work. That is not a president who's getting the Sharpie ready to sign a 60% tariff on the sale of goods made in China to the United States. My personal bet is Donald Trump is not going to do the crazy tariffs that he talked about in his campaign, which the Wall Street Journal and every other economist in America accurately reported would skyrocket inflation. Donald Trump will be talked out of that by people who actually understand tariffs. And then Donald Trump will publicly claim that he doesn't have to institute wildly dangerous tariffs, all of which would be paid by American consumers because the, and he'll say he doesn't need to do it because the mere threat of his tariffs has managed to get China to suddenly become a fair trading partner with the United States. So just the threat of tariffs worked. That will be the Trump tariff policy. That's my bet. In other words, he will lie his way out of his breathtakingly stupid campaign ideas about tariffs. And I suspect something similar will happen with the Trump mass deportation campaign promises. He promised to deport at least 11 million people. Nothing like that has ever been done in human history. There is no place on earth that has ever picked up and moved 11 million people to another place on earth. The cost of trying to deport 11 million people in this country would be at least $315 billion, according to one estimate. The entire budget of the Justice Department is $50 billion. Donald Trump plans to do giant tax cuts for his billionaire friends and for corporations. So the money for deportation would have to come from somewhere else in the federal budget. There's only $50 billion in the entire Justice Department budget. So you'd have to find $315 billion to deport 11 million people. It's never going to happen. The number of law enforcement personnel in the United States of America would have to at least triple with all the new ones being hired exclusively by the federal government to exclusively work on deportation roundups. If you ever get to watch our best police departments like the NYPD make an arrest when they are doing it the right way, the best way, it tends to be at least six to one, at least six police officers surrounding one person being arrested. It is never one-to-one. -one. So just to show you the mathematical impossibility of deporting 11 million people, we're not going to have 11 million deportation officers to do that. Consider that there are currently a grand total in all 50 states of 8 100,000 law enforcement officers in the United States. That's everyone from local police officers to FBI agents, state police, everyone with a gun and a badge. Everyone, 800,000. If every single law enforcement official in the United States of America stopped everything they were doing and none of them slept and everything they were doing stopped, all of the protecting of you stopped and they devoted themselves to doing nothing but deporting 11 million people, they couldn't do it. There aren't enough of them. Because each one of them would need to personally round up by himself or herself 13 people at a time. And I say all of this not to suggest that Donald Trump won't cruelly ruin lives and rip apart families through deportation. He will. But he absolutely will not ever be able to create a mass deportation operation in the United States that deports 11 million people. That's impossible. 
and he knows it. He will definitely deport thousands of people. He may deport 100,000 people over the four years. But he knows today that he can't possibly deliver on the mass deportation promised to his voters of 11 million people or more, which is why when Kristen Welker asked him about his deportation plan, he did not say even the single word deportation. Didn't say a word about it. After Donald Trump finished his rambling non-answer to Kristen Welker's first question, she followed that up with, do you know what that price tag looks like, your deportation plan? Do you have a price tag? And Donald Trump said, it's not a question of a price tag. It's not. Really, we have no choice. When people have been killed and murdered and when drug lords have destroyed counties, countries, and now they're going back to those countries because they're not staying here, it's not quite, there is no price tag. That's correct. There is no price tag because there is no plan. None. And there are no law enforcement officers in the United States today with nothing to do who are available to take on the task of mass deportation of 11 million people. There will definitely be Trump deportations. But how many? And who will decide that? Which brings us back to President who? Who is really going to be the president deciding just how many resources can be redirected to deportation? Donald Trump has said, if you take him at his word, which of course no one ever should, that he's going to leave deportation and everything else up to Robert Kennedy Jr. Donald Trump has actually said he's going to leave everything in the government up to Robert Kennedy Jr. except oil and gas. That means the Defense Department. That means everything. Donald Trump wants to keep all the oil and gas decisions to himself, which will give him a lot of free time because the government is not in the oil and gas business. And Donald Trump will tell his White House Chief of Staff, Chief of Staff to make sure every oil drilling permit gets approved in this country, and that's it. And that will take less than one minute of presidential time. Donald Trump has actually said this about Robert Kennedy Jr. I've been friends of his for a long time, and I'm going to let him go wild on health. I'm going to let him go wild on the food. I'm going to let him go wild on medicine. The only thing I don't think I'm going to let him even get near is the liquid gold under our feet. He wants to do some things, and we're going to let him go to it. I just said, but Bobby, leave the oil to me. We have more liquid gold than any country in the world, more than Saudi Arabia. We have more than Russia. Bobby, stay away from the liquid gold. Other than that, go have a good time, Bobby. So that's it. According to Donald Trump, President Bobby Kennedy is in charge of tax cuts for billionaires and corporations. President Bobby Kennedy is in charge of mass deportations. President Bobby Kennedy is in charge of all health care issues. President Bobby Kennedy is in charge of the entire presidency. Everything, except anything, involving oil and gas. So, what's President Kennedy going to do? Are we going to have a President Kennedy? Or are we going to have a President Elon Musk? Donald Trump said, at the suggestion of Elon Musk, who has given me his complete and total endorsement, I will create a government efficiency commission tasked with conducting complete financial and performance audit of the entire federal government and making recommendations for drastic reforms. Okay. So if Elon Musk is going to do an evaluation of the entire federal government and the entire federal budget and decide which parts of the federal government should have funding cuts or funding increases. That's called being president of the United States. So, will we have a President Musk? A new and perhaps even more likely president emerged today. 
But according to Donald Trump's hiring and firing record, this would be a temporary president. Maybe six months. Donald Trump announced in a written statement today that he has chosen Susan Wiles, his campaign manager, as his first White House chief of staff. In his previous four years in the White House, Donald Trump went through four White House chiefs of staff. The first White House, White House chief of staff was fired after about six months on the job, 192 days to be specific. Susie Wiles has a traditional Republican establishment background, starting in 1979 as a low-level assistant in the office of Buffalo Republican Congressman Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp was an NFL quarterback who finished his career with the Buffalo Bills and became a Republican member of the House of Representatives. Jack Kemp was one of the big star Republicans in Congress in those days. He ran for president in the 1988 primaries and then was chosen in 1996 as Bob Dole's running mate for vice president against Bill Clinton and Al Gore. Susie Wiles went from Jack Kemp's team to Ronald Reagan's 1980 presidential campaign as a scheduler. In 2008, she was a Florida County co-chair for John McCain's presidential campaign. In 2011, she worked on the Republican presidential campaign of Utah's John Huntsman, who was a moderate Republican who had served as President Obama's ambassador to China. Susie Wiles had no history in extremist Republican politics until she joined the Trump campaign in 2016. In a profile of Wiles in Politico in April, Fernanda Mondi, a Florida-based Democratic pollster and MSNBC analyst, called her smart and sophisticated. The article says, many who know Wiles and who were not at all glad Trump was ever the president and even less glad he might be president again are quite glad that she at least is still at his side. If Donald Trump is going to be president, I want Susie Wiles involved, said Carlos Corbello, the former Republican Congress member, who's an opponent of Donald Trump's. If this guy wins, and I certainly hope he doesn't, but if he were to win, I would hope to hell that she will play a major role, said her friend Paul McCormick. So, will we have a President Wiles? Susie Wiles knows more about how to be president than Robert Kennedy Jr. does, or Elon Musk does, and she knows more about how to be president than Donald Trump does, much more, and she's going to have the biggest office in the West Wing of the White House that is not occupied by Donald Trump, and she's going to be in that office an awful lot more than Donald Trump is going to be in his office. When someone needs an answer to a presidential question, will they go to an empty Oval Office where the guy who's supposed to be there is out golfing somewhere, or will they take that short walk down the end of the hall to the corner office of the White House Chief of Staff? It's a rectangular office, not an Oval Office, but that's where the real president might be sitting, in the Trump White House. In Donald Trump's speech on election night, the only policy he mentioned were the two words, cutting taxes. He never said the word tariff. He never said the word deportation. Nothing else, cutting taxes. He will sign a tax cut written by Republicans in Congress. And that could be the only campaign promise he actually keeps. On election night, when in the middle of his speech, Donald Trump invited assorted cast of characters to say something into the microphone. Watch what happened when he invited Susie Wiles to the microphone. Because in that moment, she alone among the people on that stage proved that she knows exactly how to handle Donald Trump. She knows exactly what he really wants, which is all the attention. Susie, come, Susie, come here. Come here, Susie. Chris, come here, Chris. Susie likes to stay sort of in the back, let me tell you. The Ice Man, we call her the Ice Man. Come here, Susie. Chris, come here, Chris. Susie likes to stay in the background. She's not in the background. Come here, Susie. 
Yeah. So she let the guy who worked for her in the campaign do the talking. She wouldn't say a word into that microphone. Not one word. If the real president is going to be Susie Wiles, she knows the one thing that she has to do publicly is never get caught being president, which is exactly why she turned away from that microphone on election night. Leading off our discussion tonight is Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell of California. He served as an impeachment manager in the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump and is suing Donald Trump over the January 6th attack. Carson Swalwell, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Let me start with where do we stand in the House of Representatives and what the seat count is? We are still counting votes in some districts in California. There's about five seats that are in play in California. The drop from tonight is encouraging. Uh, most of the ballots uh, are going our way. There's probably 100,000 in each seat to count. The House is still in play. But, Lawrence, it's either going to be a one to two seat majority for Republicans or a one to two seat majority for the Democrats. Either way, Hakeem Jeffries will be the Speaker of the House because when Republicans ran the House for the last two years, it was Speaker Jeffries who functionally delivered the majority of the votes for any vote that mattered. And so hopefully, formally, uh, we can make him the speaker. But we know how to do this, and it's going to be the House uh, who will have to fence Trump in. So we saw how much power you actually had in the minority in this last session, where in order to get any uh, budget vote through, uh, the, they had to come to the Democrats, which, which seems to indicate if that's the way it's going to work next time, even if you are two votes down in the House, uh, they really cannot push an agenda through there in the way they might expect to. You know, we will stay unified, working for working people, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, we reflect what the American people want on reproductive rights, uh, what they expect when it comes to uh, a tax system that doesn't benefit uh, only the wealthy. And there are Republicans are, who are in districts that Kamala Harris won or came very close in, and it's not going to be so easy uh, for them to just capitulate to Donald Trump. So uh, either way, I, I feel very confident uh, that, you know, we can be an effective check uh, on the on the House side. And, and Carson, when you saw the most optimistic scenario that I can come up with is that Donald Trump really is serious about cutting taxes and he'll get that done for billionaires and corporations. They did it before. But there's a distinct possibility that Donald Trump will not even try to deliver on some of his more terrifying uh, campaign promises. The fight, Lawrence, is really going to be over the next eight to 10 weeks as Donald Trump puts in place the people who will carry out Trump's Project 2025. We know that he's not capable of doing that himself. Look, Donald Trump is unencur unencumbered by the thought process. You could roll dice and you would likely get a number higher than his IQ. It's impossible to underestimate the guy. So that means when it comes to who runs the health care system and make sure our kids can get vaccines, we have to hold the Senate accountable and make sure it's not RFK Jr. When it comes to who's going to enact our foreign policy and represent us abroad, it can't be an extremist like Rick Grinnell. So I, I know people are upset. We're grieving right now. But there's more plays on the field. And so we need to put our helmets on, get back out there and make sure that the people who are going to execute this policy for somebody who's really just going to stay on the sidelines, that those people are not the most extreme people from our country. Congressman Eric Swalwell, thank you so much for starting off our discussion. My pleasure. Tonight. Thank you. Today, Joe Biden showed the world how an American president is supposed to respond when his party loses an election. Pulitzer Prize winning author and presidential historian John Meacham will join us next. On this day, exactly 52 years ago, November 7th, 1972, then 29-year-old Joe Biden was elected to the United States Senate. He turned 30, the mandatory minimum age for United States senators, before he was sworn in. It was on this day, exactly four years ago, November 7th, 2020, that enough votes were counted to declare Joe Biden the next president of the United States. There was dancing in the streets, literally dancing in the streets all across the country that day, celebrating Joe Biden's win and Donald Trump's defeat. 
It was the day four years ago when Donald Trump was supposed to say and never did say, congratulations to the winner. Once again today, Joe Biden proved that he is a better person than Donald Trump ever has been or ever will be. Yesterday, I spoke with President-elect Trump to congratulate him on his victory. And I assured him that I would direct my entire administration to work with his team to ensure a peaceful and orderly transition. That's what the American people deserve. The Biden-Harris administration is providing the Trump team with day one transition assistance. They are providing office space for them and everything they need. That would be unremarkable, but for the fact that Donald Trump refused to do that four years ago. For the first time in our history, the outgoing president refused to cooperate in any way with the transition to the new administration. The Biden-Harris transition team was penalized by Donald Trump and couldn't really get started until January. President Biden addressed members of his administration, including cabinet members in the Rose Garden today. Yesterday, I also spoke with Vice President Harris. She's been a partner and a public servant. She ran an inspiring campaign, and everyone got to see something that I learned early on to respect so much, her character. She has a backbone like a ramrod. She has great character, true character. She gave her whole heart and effort and she and her entire team should be proud of the campaign they ran. Donald Trump has been a candidate three times. He lied about the electoral process every time. This time he lied about this presidential election being unfair and promised that the vote counting would be false and corrupt before the election. But this time when the votes were counted in his favor, he had absolutely no complaints, nothing to say about what he had called our fraudulent election system. Campaigns are contests of competing visions. The country chooses one or the other. We accept the choice the country made. I've said many times, you can't love your country only when you win. You can't love your neighbor only when you agree. Something I hope we can do uh, no matter who you voted for to see each other not as adversaries, but as fellow Americans, bring down the temperature. I also hope we can lay to rest the question about the integrity of the American electoral system. It is honest, it is fair, and it is transparent. And it can be trusted, win or lose. I also hope we can restore the respect for all our election workers who busted their necks and took risks at the outset. We should thank them. Thank them for staffing voting sites, counting the votes, protecting the very integrity of the election. Many of them are volunteers who do it simply out of love for their country. And as they did, as they did their duty as citizens, I will do my duty as president. I'll fulfill my oath. And I will honor the Constitution. On January 20th, we'll have a peaceful transfer of power here in America. To his staff and his cabinet members and supporters of the Biden-Harris administration all over the country, the president said, giving up is unforgivable. Look, folks, you all know it in your lives. Setbacks are unavoidable. But giving up is unforgivable. Setbacks are unavoidable, but giving up is unforgivable. We all get knocked down. <clears throat> but the measure of our character, as my dad would say, is how quickly we get back up. Remember, a defeat does not mean we are defeated. We lost this battle. The America of your dreams is calling for you to get back up. That's the story of America for over 240 years and counting. It's a story for all of us, not just some of us. The American experiment endures. We're going to be OK, but we need to stay engaged. We need to keep going. And above all, we need to keep the faith. I'm so proud to have worked with all of you. I really mean it. I sincerely mean it. Well, God bless you all. God bless America, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
Joining us now is Pulitzer Prize-winning author and presidential historian John Meacham. He is the Rogers Chair in the American Presidency at Vanderbilt University and has advised President Biden on historical matters. John, uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And so, uh, after one very violent lapse, the peaceful transition of power has returned. It has, and as you said, uh, President Biden uh, has been doing this for a long time and is an institutionalist to his core, uh, understands the founding documents and not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. As you alluded to, he's my friend and I help him when I can, so take this for what it's worth. But what we want in a president is someone who is fluent in the vernacular of grace as well as power. And I think we're going to miss this. John, uh, as you think about uh, Joe Biden, uh, you know, any, politi any other politician I've known, election losses are the worst losses they ever suffered in their lives. We all know that's not true for Joe Biden, who has had loss of life in his family, of his loved ones, uh, unlike any other uh, politician in, in his position, a child, yeah. wife, and then a, an adult son. Uh, when you see Joe Biden today, when you see what, what he's doing, doing exactly what he's supposed to do, uh, what is your sense of what he's feeling now? You're right. I mean, the, the, the story of, of Joe Biden is one of unimaginable highs and unfathomable lows. And I think that, you know, even when he reached the pinnacle, it was a complicated thing, right? He comes into power amid COVID. Uh, many of the traditional uh, uh, elements of the presidency were not part of his presidency. Didn't have a convention in 2020. Uh, the inauguration, remember the eerie scene in Washington after January 6th. And so it's, it's been a, an odd presidency in that sense, stylistically. And I think that uh, he has persistently uh, attempted to be a, a faithful custodian of what he and we uh, have come to expect, with the one very big exception, uh, in that office. Uh, the other thing about President Biden, of course, is the, the span uh, of this public career. Fifty years in public life is as if someone had come to office in the first year of the War of 1812 and then left the year of the Battle of Gettysburg, right? I mean, this is a chunk of our history, and it's uh, an amazing life. We're going to squeeze in a quick break, and we'll be back with more with John Meacham. We have legislation we passed. It's just only now just really kicking in. We're going to see over a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure work done, changing people's lives in rural communities and communities that are in real difficulty because it takes time to get it done. And so much more it's going to take time. But it's there. You know, we're leaving behind the strongest economy in the world. Still with us, John Meacham. John, the political challenge for President Biden and Kamala Harris is the kind of legislative work that they did, that they got accomplished, doesn't kick in during the election year and will be certainly uh, providing a lot of political benefit over the next years uh, of the Trump presidency. Yeah, it's, uh, it reminds me of George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, mm -hmm. who once said, moods come and go, but greatness endures. 
uh, reminds me of Harry Truman, who left town with a 19 percent approval rating uh, in 1953, and yet at NATO, the Marshall Plan, uh, the integration of the military, so the initial, the first steps toward civil rights, so much of that uh, grew in the decades afterward. And remember, is there any American president that you or I can think of who wouldn't want to be Harry Truman? Uh, mm -hmm. But it took time. And history and headlines just don't run in tandem. And that was even when we just had headlines, much less chirons and, and mm -hmm. TikTok. Yes. So uh, hist history is about, history like democracy is about taking a deep breath. John Meacham, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank and coming up, our next guest, Melanie Campbell, is one of the people who advised Joe Biden four years ago to choose Kamala Harris as his vice presidential running mate. Today, Melanie Campbell said this in the New York Times. She ran a damn good race, and we voted for white nationalism. This level of vote was not because they were worried about grocery prices. They were worried about white privilege, white status, and sent the message that a multicultural democracy is fine as long as they're at the top. Baltimore's Mayor Brandon Scott was re-elected on Tuesday, and the next day, he said this. This morning, I woke up and I just uh, gave my wife a hug because I know how heavy this is weighing on black women. And they have carried this country and saved this country too many times and continue to be the most disrespected human beings on the planet. And it, quite frankly, it disgusts me. I'm thinking about the world that we're going to bring our daughter into in a few months. And I want the vice president to know uh, that her and her team did everything right in the right way. But the unfortunate reality is that this country is still steeped in racism, sexism, and misogyny. Last week on this program, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Isabel Wilkerson framed the election in terms of the American caste system. Isabel Wilkerson is the author of the best-selling book that has been praised by President Obama titled Caste, The Origins of Our Discontents. I asked Isabel Wilkerson, what unites voters like the born rich preppy Tucker Carlson and a plumber who joins Tucker Carlson and Elon Musk to vote for the candidate who opposes an increase in the minimum wage, who opposes unions, and has actively tried to take health care coverage away from 30 million people. When we look at this, when people look at this as an election or only as an election, then it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Right. When you look at this as an existential crisis over what the country will be, then it begins to make sense. People are not voting against their own interests. People are not voting against their own interests. They're voting for the interests that matter most to them. And for many, many, many Americans, as we saw on January 6th, this means maintaining their position at the very top of the American hierarchy, at the top of the American caste system, with all the rights and privileges that accrue to that. And that is not something that maybe is in the best interest of the planet or the country, but that is the best interest of the people as they ascertain it for themselves. Joining us now is Melanie Campbell, chairwoman of the Power of the Ballot Action Fund, an advocacy group focused on policies for black Americans. She also served on a committee of women who advised President Biden on choosing Vice President Harris as his running mate four years ago. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. What is your view of what was happening in this election? Uh, thank you, Lawrence, uh, for the invitation. Um, the results uh, uh, bear out uh, that for whatever, and I'm not a white person to be able to respond to that, but for whatever reason, uh, race and sex, racism, racism and sexism seem to be the reason. Um, white women who were really much apart, we thought, uh, this time, would actually join forces with all women 
and vote for the first woman president, the first black and South Asian woman president. When this was uh, in July 21st happened and when with black women, that was one of those 44 million with Joe Taker and many, many others. Um, and then there was white women for Kamala and white dudes for Kamala and so on and so on that had a glimpse of hope that this would be the case. But the results bear out that 53, at least the, the early numbers show 53% 53, 53 of white women voted uh, for Donald Trump. Who is a sexist? Who is a white nationalist? And so there's a lot of feeling of betrayal um, in this moment. Um, but also, we know that Kamala Harris ran an awesome race with 100 days. When you look at the numbers of how she did, I heard a lot of back and forth, but when you bear out the numbers, she didn't lose by very much in those states with 100, 107 days. It wasn't her race to run, but uh, the way it happened is the way it happened. And so I also want to say that there were Black women who won. So there's some glimpses of hope, but when it comes to the top, up the top job, if you will, for whatever the reason, this country is not ready to elect a woman, let alone a black woman, uh, to the highest uh, position in the land. And we saw big expressions of agreements with Kamala Harris's position, for example, on abortion, where in Florida, 57 percent of the voters voted for her position on abortion, and then they vote against her for president. Uh, there's plenty of evidence that it's not her policies they're voting against. Yeah. The last time a uh, white woman voted for a Democratic nominee that won was 1992. So there is something uh, going on when it comes to that. Um, and that we won't, even when you have a, a, a now president-elect for the second time, who has been very uh, much not hiding uh, in my opinion, his racism is, and his sexism and misogyny. Uh, you had 54% some uh, around there of, of Latino men who voted for Donald Trump, even though he's talking about deporting 11 million people. So the issue, the history in this country around race uh, has never been fully addressed. Uh, we have these moments where we know we, we've come a long way from what my parents and grandparents went through. But in my lifetime, uh, it's still something that has uh, that is uh, yet to be fully addressed. And when George Floyd happened and Maude Arbery and Breonna Taylor, we thought maybe this time uh, in 2020 and all that happened. But it didn't happen then. It was backlash. And so this moment, um, I think we moved uh, Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, moved the ball forward. Because remember, uh, 2016, Hillary Clinton moved the ball forward, but we're not there yet. And so it's a, it's really hard. But you know, let's say joy comes in the morning, and the race is not over. But this country, I'm afraid, is going to have to go through a reckoning um, um, in the next few years uh, with the current um, president elect uh, for 2025. Melanie L. Campbell, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us tonight. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Thank you.